I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 when my father and brother and I were at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. All right, so it's now 7 o'clock. Good evening and welcome to the Monday, April 2nd meeting of the Pembroke Board of Selectmen. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be advised that this meeting is being made available to the public through a live video and audio broadcast on Comcast Government Access Channel 15. It is also being recorded for airing on the channel at future dates. Comments made in open session will be recorded. There are two announcements this evening. The first being that the Household Hazardous Waste Day will be held on Saturday, April 28th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Pembroke Recycling Center. A list of items that will be and will not be accepted appears on the town website at www.pembroke-ma.gov. The second announcement is that the DPW has announced that on Wednesday, April 4th, between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5 a.m., the broken water gate valve will be replaced at the intersection on Mattachusett Street and Furnace Lane. Affected streets will include Alma Avenue, Pond View Avenue, Pinecrest Avenue, and Scobie Avenue. Water may be disconnected during this process. More information is available on the town website. All right, diving right into our first appointment at 7 p.m. We'll be meeting with the Plymouth County Treasurer, Tom O'Brien. He's here with an update on the Plymouth County Retirement System. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. The mic on. Everything's good. First of all, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. As mentioned, I'm Tom O'Brien. I'm the chairman of the Plymouth County Retirement Association. However, I've brought a team, so you're not stuck just listening to me. You're going to hear a little bit about our organization. We want to make sure that we take some time to answer questions that you have. It's actually a thrill for us to be here. We appreciate the invitation from the Board of Selectmen. Although I have to admit, when I woke up this morning, I said, please, not again. A little snow. I wasn't expecting that. I also have to offer my thanks to uh, Ed Thorne and to Sabrina. We were scheduled, as you know, to be here on March 5th, uh, Winter Storm Riley. We got notice ahead of time, so the folks that traveled from far distances uh, got notice, and we were able to reschedule for today. I also want to thank Kathleen McCarthy and Michael Buckley, uh, and Michael's here as well, because they've been very good about keeping us informed, and it's important that you folks have up-to-date, accurate information. Let me just mention the team that we have here. I'm going to do a quick oversight, and we'll get to their presentation. So just to make sure you're getting good, up-to-date, accurate information, we brought along David Sullivan. He's our executive director. He'll be making a quick presentation. He'll be followed by Dan Dinan. Dan is a principal at Makita Investments. They are in our investment consultant. We think they are one of the best, not just in Massachusetts, but in the country, and we're pleased to have them. We retained them about two and a half years ago and uh, are very happy for the professional advice that they give to us. And then our cleanup hitter for tonight, the one I think you're really looking forward to, Charlie, you gotta shut off your phone. Yeah. Or answer the door, one of the two, <laughs> is Dan Sherman. Uh, he is the actuary for our system. He has been for a number of years. He is principal and owner of Sherman Actuary Services uh, and certainly well respected in the industry uh, around the country and makes presentations uh, all over the place. So we're very fortunate to have him. I just wanted to, despite perhaps rumors to the contrary, remind you folks that the Plymouth County Retirement Association is a local, full-service, member-centric, professional, transparent organization. 
And that's important, each one of those, for reasons that I think are self-evident. First of all, we're local. So if you or any resident in Pembroke has an issue, has a concern, something that they'd like to address, it is a lot more convenient to go to our office at 10 Cordage Park in Plymouth than it might be to travel elsewhere. We want to make sure that we are responsive, we are close, we're convenient. Our hours of operation uh, are from 7.30 to 5 p.m., 7.30 in the morning to 5 p.m. So we certainly try to make ourselves available for our members. Additionally, we're full service. We have a 10-member staff, and David's going to touch a little bit on that. Uh, we have an up-to-date website, which we hope you visited regularly. I'm not sure I've seen e any of you scrolling on it, but we encourage you to. Um, we have a member service portal, which is very popular with our members, including those residents here in the town of Pembroke. And we are really focused in the, in the past few months and the coming months on increasing our technology. We recognize that uh, that is where we're going to be able to effectuate some economies of scale and continue to focus on that effort, and David may or may not touch upon that. It's important, too, that you know that we're member-centric. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't introduce, at this point, another member of the board, John Sciarra. John has been on the board for more than 20 years. I don't know the exact number, but 21. 21? Oh, so I was right, more than 20, uh, and brings and lends his expertise to us. But we have a knowledgeable executive director. Uh, we hired David a, a few years ago. We're pleased to have him. He has a breadth of experience I think you will be impressed with. Our board is extremely active. We attend uh, a number of continuing education programs on a regular basis. Uh, the board attends our regular monthly meetings. And I certainly want to encourage you at this point, every member of the board, to feel free to come to any of our meetings. I think some of the information you get isn't direct from the source. And we really want you to know that it's available direct from the source anytime you want it or anytime you need it. Uh, we're a professional organization. We have what we think is one of the finest consultants in Dan Dynan from Akita, a great actuary, Dan Sherman, and we have a professional auditor, Powers and Sullivan. So we put together a pretty good team that is recognized around Massachusetts. Most importantly, we are extremely transparent. I would actually stack what we put up and make available on our website uh, and simply by a phone call against what's available in other retirement systems, not just here in Massachusetts, but around the country. Uh, all of our board minutes are published regularly. All of our audits are available. Uh, and we want to make sure that you have access to that information anytime you want it. And we'll continue to make that a priority. It's also important to note that in addition to all of that, we are focused on the long-term inve investment process. We're not investing for five years. We're not investing for 10 years. We're not investing for 20 years. We're not investing for 25 years. We're investing 50 to 100 years. And we recognize that, and the value that we bring to the table is that we understand we're not in this for the short term, we're not in this for the midterm, but we are in this for the long term. And I think our track record proves that. Over the last 28 years, our annualized return on a gross basis has been greater than 9%. So if you're looking historically at our performance, I think it's pretty remarkable. I'm also pleased to report that from 1989 to 2017, we grew this fund, and this was before my time, so I can't take all the credit. Even John can't take all the credit, although Joe McDonough can take a significant amount of credit, from 95.6 million to over a billion dollars. That's remarkable performance, particularly when you think of the downturns in the market that we've survived and the Great Recession that we survived. Additionally, um, we expect, unlike the PRIT fund, which is the state fund, to be fully funded by 2029. Just by comparison, the state is on schedule to be funded by 2036. So we have that flexibility, and I know Dan will touch on that when he has a chance, which really is of value to our members, including the town of Pembroke. Um, interestingly enough, and just to report, as of February 28, 2018, we were ever so slightly, by the slimmest of margins, uh, on a gross basis, on a 10-year rolling basis, slightly ahead of the state fund. Meaning that over the last 10 years, in a very, very slim margin, we've outperformed the state fund. Um, despite this remarkable success, we're always looking to improve. We welcome suggestions if you have any, and we certainly encourage you to attend at any point in time. As Arthur and Dan and Matthew and Lou and most specifically, Ed, no, I could 
go on for a long time, but I want you to hear from our professionals. Ed, don't nod so quickly. I want you to hear from the professionals that we have. So I'm going to turn it over to David, and we want to make sure there's a chance for questions. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions of me, I'll be happy to answer them. But let's get through maybe the whole presentation. Does that make sense? Okay, without further ado, our executive director, David Sullivan. Just, uh, my name is David Sullivan. I've been um, working in this field of pension funds in Massachusetts for almost 35 years now. Um, I've done different capacities. Um, Tom's touched along a lot of the things that we've done since I've started in Plymouth um, to almost two and a quarter years ago. It was January 2016. And you know, one of the, he hit a lot of the efficiencies we're going off. But one of the things I, I'm big on is, is just membership relations. You know, we, we, we're, we're trying to talk to, you know, active members, retirees, and, and try and be, you know, if they come into my office, the, you know, the most important thing I do that day. And so we do that for all your members, all your the Pembroke employees, all your Pembroke retirees. You know, we take their um, concerns, their retirement benefit very seriously, and we try and provide them the best um, um, counseling that I possibly can. Um, we get out there. We get invited to a town benefit fair. I forget exactly when it is. I don't know if it's April or May. I'll be coming out here probably in this room in a little bit. And sometimes we go out and we'll do presentations. You know, so if the town wants us, we'll, we'll have membership. We come to a room like this. We fill these rooms up. We totally fill these rooms up with a lot of questions. And then a lot of times, you know, for the next few days, I'm getting a lot of phone calls. So, you know, that, that's a good way so we can educate membership the best as possible. Um, that's the, something else I think it, it's important for us to do for the Pembroke um, membership um, in retirees. And it's also um, the town hall. You know, we're, we're partners. You know, there could be a question on, you know, what, what do we do with this person? What do we do in this situation? So we'll constantly, you know, Kathleen and Jennifer, we're, we're constantly in communication to try and get the right answer to do things the right way, um, right away. So some days, you know, I, f I feel like I'm doing a lot of legal work. Um, but if... if Push comes to shove, I'm not a lawyer, so we're, we're using our um, counsel. We have a few different counsel on, on retain, uh, not on retainer, but on, on our roster. We deal with them. Some days I feel like, you know, we're dealing with disabilities. I feel like I have to know a lot of medicine, but I, I'm, I'm not a doctor either. So then we rely on the professionals. Um, we we'll would send it out to a medical doctor. A lot of times it's the investment. It's very big, you know, what's going on, but at the end of the day, we defer to the investment consultant. Same thing. We have an actuarial question. I know a lot about it. But when it, when it comes down to it, we defer to the, to the actuary. So we have, a, we have a lot of relationships, a lot of professional relationships. And we try and know the, as much as we can on any given subject. But at the end of the day, we also we partner with not only the towns, but our, our professional partners. And we're always here. You know, for, again, if, if anyone ever wants me to come out and um, talk about retirement, I'm always happy to do it. Beyond that, I'll go to Dan. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Dynan uh, with Makita Investment Group. I'm the investment consultant that works with the Plymouth County Retirement Board. Uh, one of the firm's uh, uh, shareholders. Um, I put together a presentation to, to cover today. Probably three aspects that I, that I want you to, to hear about. One is an overview of Makita. Uh, we're probably a firm you've never heard of unless you're in the institutional investment business. Uh, two, give you a high level of the retirement board, the retirement association, and then thirdly, address how we're advising clients in this in this investing environment, and more importantly, how Plymouth County is is taking that advice, the actions that taken since we've been hired since the the end of 2015. So, uh, if I could turn your attention to page four, the high level review of Makita Investment Group, which is probably the the largest investment firm you've never heard of. Uh, we were founded in 1978 by a gentleman by the name of Jim Makita. Jim was one of the few to work for the, the Harvard Endowment staff, uh, ultimately leaving the endowment to advise pension fund clients. Uh, that client that initially hired us in 1978 is still a happy client today. Uh, we've helped them earn a, a net rate of return of greater than 10% per year since that time. Uh, today we work with 166 clients, and we advise just shy of $600 billion. On behalf of those clients, our clients have over a trillion dollars. We advise only institutions. We don't work with any, any retail money, no high net worth money or anything like that. Only institutions, just like Plymouth County. Uh, we have six offices. Uh, we're headquartered just outside of Boston. It's in Westwood officially. 
but we have six offices really across the, the country. Uh, and we're, we're a big firm, 143 people, but well-resourced, and we take pride in the research and the advice that we give. In terms of some of our clients on the following page, we have our, our public fund experience. We've been working with public funds just like Public County since 1998. Again, that client is still a client today. Uh, today we advise $475 billion on behalf of 44 public fund clients across the country. Locally here in Massachusetts, we advise 11 mass public funds, again, just like Plymouth County. Uh, in terms of some of the other funds uh, we advise, they're listed on page 5 here. Uh, nationally, we advise some of the largest and most sophisticated institutional investors out there. A lot of state plans, uh, Cal State Teachers Retirement System, the sec second biggest pension fund in the country, uh, State of Connecticut, State of Illinois, State of Maryland, Washington State Investment Board. So some of the largest, most sophisticated plans in the country hire Makita, just like Plymouth County hires Makita for the same research and strategic advice. In terms of Plymouth County specifically, I want you to turn your attention to page 7. I think this executive summary hits on uh, really the three key takeaways that I want you to take away from at least our presentation today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the Plymouth County Board is a fully engaged board that understands the investment environment. Uh, the board is forward-looking looking, and they've adopted policies and practices that help maximize the, the probability of making their assumed rates of return. Secondly, the board is dedicated and committed to building a world-class investment portfolio. We spend on a monthly basis four hours talking about investments. Uh, we had a meeting in November where it was a six-hour investment meeting. Now, uh, this board is dedicated. They spend the time that's, that's needed to build a world-class investment portfolio. They don't take the easy way out. Anytime I need an hour or two hours, the board is more than, more than happy to, to give it to us to, to advise uh, and give them the right advice. And thirdly, and I hope this comes across today, the board employs competent professionals, and that would include Makita as well as Dan Sherman. Just personally, on an, as an anecdote, I, I personally work with 10 clients. Uh, they range from a couple hundred million dollars to my biggest client is $6 billion. And the Plymouth County Board is the most engaged and dedicated board that I work with. So I, I, would, I would venture to say that across Makita clients, Plymouth County is among the most dedicated of board members. So as a stakeholder, I would feel... I would feel pleased uh, that your board is taking that type of approach. In terms of performance, we have performance of uh, the Retirement Association on the following page. And this is through, through December 31st, 2017. It's trailing period performance, 13510, all the way back uh, to 1985. And you'll see consistently versus the peer median, the peer group. Uh, the Retirement Association is consistently outperforming or at least performing in line with national peers. Uh, the peer median uh, is the investor force, all public defined benefit plans. That's an, an MSCI product. It's a large, uh, robust data set. Uh, and you'll see Plymouth County is, is performing in line or better over, over most time periods. That said, we've only been working with Plymouth County since the beginning of 2016, so we can't take credit for this. But certainly, uh, I know we've made a lot of improvements since we've been on board in the past three years, and <coughs> we'll give you some examples in a few minutes. The board's been hard at work on your behalf. Uh, the next page, we want to talk a little bit about the environment and, and how we're advising clients. On page nine, uh, we have just some statistics on investing for the long term. We have the historical rates of return for major asset classes, and then our, our 20 year forward looking uh, projections. And across all asset classes, uh, expected returns are down, anywhere between 1% to 4%. Valuations are high, rates are low, and as you'd expect, expected returns are low. Well, how does that impact investing for a 30, 40, 50 year time period? Well, it means you need to invest more in equities and less in bonds. And if the plan today was to continue with what, what worked years ago, then it's probably not going to work well. Plymouth County is not taking that approach. They're looking at every... Uh, every aspect in doing what's necessary to be uh, confident in making their assumed rate return over the next 20 years, which is what's most important. So w what can investors do? How are we advising clients? We show that on page 10. And these are, uh, this is our strategic advice. This is advice we share to all clients in terms of how to make their assumed rates of return, whether it's 4% or 10%. Uh, 
Uh, number one, seek to reduce fees where appropriate. Be proactive and active in negotiating fees. Uh, when you use active management and, and make sure that uh, you're, you're getting good value and you have a high level of confidence that managers can perform. Uh, secondly, benefit from the relative growth of emerging markets. Uh, emerging markets are uh, growing tremendously fast, they're strong demographic, valuations are low, invest more in emerging markets. Uh, thirdly, emphasize liquid investments. Private equities historically outperform uh, public equities by 2 to 4 percent per year, net of all fees and expenses. Uh, we think uh, long-term investors that have the ability to should invest more in private equity. Fourthly, hire and best in class managers. Again, consistent with what I said in the first bullet. When you hire an active manager, make sure you have a high level of confidence that they can add value net of fees. That's what's most important. And then finally, be willing to accept risk. And I think this gets to the spirit of, of Plymouth County as a board. They understand what, what risk is. Risk is not standard deviation. Risk is not volatility. It's not loss of capital this year. Risk is not being able to satisfy the benefit payments that have been promised. That's the risk. Uh, Plymouth County takes that into approach, that takes that into account with their approach, and focuses on the long term in making those return expectations. I want to give you a couple of examples of the steps that Plymouth County has taken since we've been hired. It's been a busy couple of years for, for us and the board. We show that on pages 11 and 12. So the first, you know, the first step to, to uh, make it work in this environment, reduce fees. In 2016, one of the first things that we did uh, with David Sullivan, the executive director, was to, to start a, a, co a comprehensive fee analysis and fee negotiation. We went to each one of the existing providers and negotiated a, a much better uh, fee schedule in a number of cases. Just that negotiation in itself, leveraging the system, leveraging Makita, we were able to save $256,000 per year in management fees. But it doesn't end there. Uh, whenever we are looking for new pieces of business, we use Plymouth County's scale as, as a being a billion dollar investor, but also Makita's scale and having uh, almost uh, $500 billion of advisable assets to negotiate terms on, on our client's behalf. And I've listed four examples just recently of, of more advantageous fee schedules that we were able to negotiate on, on, on the county's behalf. Uh, that's an additional $245,000 in fee savings for this year. Finally, within fees, uh, Plymouth County invests in direct private equity investments without the uh, extra layer of fees that's provided from a fund of fund investment. Uh, we advise them in private equity, we have a big private equity team that on a standalone basis would be one of the largest private equity advisors out there that's in-house at Makita. And that saves ultimately millions of dollars per year in management fees. Secondly, benefit from the, the relative growth of emerging markets. Uh, it was a, a strategic piece of advice we gave to Plymouth County when we, when we first started working with them. Last year, they tripled their investment in emerging markets from 3 to 10%. In 2017, emerging markets were the best performing asset class, up 37.1% for the 2017 calendar year. And we're currently in the, in the process of conducting a search to complement their existing exposure and, and existing management. Uh, emphasize liquid investments. We increased the private equity allocation from 4% to 13%. Uh, I added uh, private real estate, private uh, um, infrastructure. And to date, we've committed and invested with 12 closed-end private equity or limited partnership vehicles uh, and put to work $179 million in, in really top-tier investment managers that we think can earn uh, mid to, to team double-digit returns. On the last page, and finally, just to, to wrap up, higher best-in-class managers, uh, and, and this is where the board's been really active as well, um, they're not comfortable just with the status quo. If, they think, if, if we think there's a better manager out there, they're willing to entertain a search and, and make sure we, have, we hire the, uh, the best manager for the money. To that date, we've put to work uh, seven new mandates, totaling $180 million. We currently have two mandates out to bid now, uh, totaling $100 million. So it's very active in terms of getting the best people uh, managing the association's money and getting those people working for you. Finally, be willing to accept risk and understand what the real risk is, and I touched on this already. Um, it's not volatility or funded ratio, return of capital, return on capital. It's making the, making the obligations that have been promised. That's what we're focused on. That's a long-term approach. It requires the right mindset, uh, but Plymouth County has adopted that sort of approach and embracing the longevity of the funds and building a portfolio that we think will earn 8.2% over the next 20 years. And that's all that I had prepared today. Thank you for your presentation.
Good evening. I'm Dan Sherman, Sherman Actuarial Services. Um, brief history, I've been working in Chapter 32 of Massachusetts Pension Plan since 1987. Started working with the Retirement Law Commission, for those that might remember um, that group, um, when I was part of uh, Johnson & Higgins. So I've been working in probably 45 to 50 of the 104 systems in Massachusetts over the years. I'm currently working with 15 uh, retirement systems today. Um, I've been on my own since 2011. Um, my handout it starts with the American Academy of Actuaries. And what I what, just want to emphasize in terms of how does an actuary set the assumptions. Um, it's not in a vacuum. It's not something where you just you know pick numbers out of the air or, or rates out of the air. We actually have a set of standards. And this first um, graph um, just states an uh, actual standards of practice 2735 the actuary is supposed to use professional judgment in selecting the assumptions based on a reasonableness. They have to be consistent uh, with the past experience, expectations, and they need to be characteristic of the particular plan. One of the things that uh, Jim Lomenzo, who's a state actuary who oversees um, all retirement systems um, at PARAC, um, has said um, in the, to me and to others, well, so-and-so lowered their interest rate or they changed the salary scale or they did they did something else, or California has re reduced their rates of assumed return. And I, I'll say to Jim, I said, but that's not the basis. You're not supposed to be lemmings. We're supposed to follow the standards of practice. And the standards of practice, the last sentence here says, you got to look at the particular <coughs> characteristics of the plan that you're valuing. And California has a completely different set of investment assumptions. They have a totally different salary structure. Mortality is different. So you, ha you just can't look at everybody else and say, this is what you ought to do because everybody else is doing it. So that's, that's a really important point that um, I've been stressing um, for the last few years. Page four, what the Society or the American Academy of Actuaries and the Society of Actuaries say is when you set assumptions, um, you should look at experience study and publish tables. And one of the things that Jim Lomenzo has not done that he was supposed to do back in 2010 is an experience study. And I've been bugging him for years. I said, Jim, when are you going to do an experience study? The one you did is in 2001. It's ancient. It's, it was small. It's old. Things have changed. Gains and losses have shown that things have changed. When are you going to do a new one? Well, someday, someday, someday. That's the same answer I keep getting. So one of the things that I initiated was I sent letters to all my clients and said, I'd like to do an experience study. It's going to cost some money, but I'd like to do it. And I was fortunate to get um, 10 retirement systems to say yes, including Plymouth County, Norfolk County, Bristol County, and cities and towns. So I had a good cross-section. I had 36,000 lives that I measured over a five-year period, which is three times the size of what the state did 17 years ago. And what came back was something I expected all along, is that the assumptions are old and out of date. They needed to be updated. I shared the results uh, with Plymouth County and the rest of the, all my clients, and I've switched to that as a new set of assumptions. Because using assumptions that are 18, 17 years old makes no sense. And um, so we made the change. Um, you got to look at um, a number of other things. For example, to plan redesign, happens. One of the things that has occurred with um, the uh, April 2nd, 2012 hires, anybody hired after that date, had a slightly different plan than the people hired before that date. And one of the things that I recognize is that these people are going to retire a little bit later, and I adjusted the table to account for that. Jim Lorenzo didn't. He's still using the original retirement rates, even though the plan has changed, which makes no sense whatsoever. People's um, the way they um, make decisions is going to be affected by the plan uh, modifications. We also have to look at national, local trends, um, and also future expectations. I've always had conversations with the retirement board to say, this is what I'm looking at for change in, say, salary scale. What do you guys think? This is what I'm seeing in mortality and so forth. And I, and I always get feedback. Yeah, Dan, that's great. Or are you crazy? But I always get feedback. Um, these guys are, are definitely engaged in, in making a decision regarding any assumptions that I, that I propose. On page five, um, each assumption has to be reasonable, and that's every single one. 
um, has to reflect my professional judgment, takes into account historical and current data, um, best estimate, no significant bias, and a range of assumptions is reasonable. So if you're saying the investment return ought to be 7.5% versus 7 and 3 quarters, I'm going to say, oh, those are you know, both reasonable. 8% is reasonable because it's within a range. If somebody came to me for Plymouth County and said, Dan, we, you should use 4%, I'm going, why? What's the basis? There's no history of that kind of return. It makes no sense. So the assumptions have to be reasonable, but they can be within a range. Um, one of the things that you can ignore are very uh, assumptions that are extremely small in nature in terms of being insignificant. I show one example here where if somebody selects uh, option A, B, or C, at retirement, be a life annuity, uh, a death benefit, or a joint survivor annuity, that selection creates a very, very tiny gain or loss, uh, depending upon the age of the individual. But it's so small to be insignificant, so the, society, the American Academy of Actuaries and the Society of Actuaries say you can ignore that. So there are some assumptions that, that we just ignore because they're just too small. Page six. One of the most important things I really try to emphasize is the assumptions do not affect the cost of the plan. The true cost of the plan is the benefits that are paid to the retirees and beneficiaries. That's the cost of the plan. As long as the money is in the trust, it's your money. But when it goes out to the individuals, then there's a cost. So what the assumptions do is really affect the timing of the, of the payments into the trust. If your assumptions are too conservative, um, you're putting in more money up front, you'll get it back later. If you're too um, aggressive, you are not put enough now, and you're going to have to pay more later. But either way, it's like the old Fram oil filter commercial. You can either pay me now or pay me later. Either way, there's going to be payments going in. The assumptions just affect the timing of when it goes in. But it can do one other thing. If, you, if your assumptions are way off in either, either direction, um, the Perceived funded status is incorrect, and that can affect decisions by the auditor, decisions in terms of plan changes, uh, or plan improvements, or cutbacks and changes. So we really need to understand, they try to get the assumptions as right as possible. And we do the best we can, um, and try not to influence it either direction in terms of being too aggressive or too conservative. So what I've got here is a, a couple of examples of, of what I mean by the terms of the timing. And so um, this is an example of, say, you have a trust with $100,000, and you know in 25 years you need a million dollars. And if you assume a 7% return, and you also want to have your payments each year increase 4% per year, so nice steady increases, initially you're going to start at a $5,000 contribution. If you have some investment gains and losses, we're going to amortize over 10 years. So if you set that all up, and you're assuming 7%, you're putting in 5,000, it goes up 4% per year. What happens if you actually earn 8% every year? In other words, you're, you're conservative in your assumption. So the graph on the following page just shows what would happen. The blue solid line is what you expect for payments. You start at 5,000 and you finish up around 13,000. Um, if you earn 8%, you start out about $3,000 and you'd finish at about 8,000. But because you assume 7 and you earn 8, you get the dot, dotted line. So as you get a greater return than you expect, it reduces your contributions. So instead of having increase in payments, you actually have flat payments. Nothing changes from year to year to year. It's basically flat uh, rather than what you expect on either one of the other curves. So that's example 1. If you did example 2 where you just do the opposite, we still need a million dollars in 25 years, um, but we're going to assume 8% assumption. So your initial payment is $3,000, investment gains are amortized over 10 years, but what happens if you always fall short? You only get 7%. You're short 1% every single year. You can probably guess what's going to happen. So the solid line expected, uh, blue is lower, it starts at 3 and finishes at 8. Uh, the dashed line is your 7% line, starting at 5 and finishing at roughly 13. But your actual, because you're always short, goes up much more steeply. So you start at 3, but then you're finishing up around $15,000. In all these cases, you still end up with a million dollars. But you can see that in case in example number 2, 
you're starting out too low at 3,000, you should be at five and you finish higher. But the cost of the plan is still a million bucks at the end of the day. Page 11. So the most important characteristic for investment returns, for me, it always has been, always will be, is the asset allocation. How are the assets invested? If you have a 7% assumption, but all the assets are bond, that's way too aggressive. If you are nothing but bonds, especially if you're like in treasuries, you should be at 3 or 4%. Uh, if you're using 6% and you're all in equities and private equities and real estate and so forth, that's, way, that's not nearly aggressive enough because you're going to outperform 6% about 95% of the time. So we need to make sure that we understand the asset allocation. So comparing Plymouth County to Bristol County to Norfolk to City of Boston, you got to look at the asset allocation and say, are they really comparable? The other thing I really have to focus on is a long-term view. 80, I'm looking 80 years out. You've got 20-year-old people working for you. I'm forecasting them all the way up to death at over 100 years old. So it's a long-term view. No 5 years, no 10 years, not 20, not 25, not even 40. It's a long-term view, 50 years at least. And one other thing I would point out that some people like to say is, geez, you know, if we're really aggressive and then we get fully funded, um, then we could become less aggressive in our funding, and I said, okay, then instead of using 8% return, I'm going to use 7%, and now you're no longer funded, fully funded. So um, you have to stay the course, even when you reach full funding. So the following chart, a little history that I like to use um, in discussing investor returns. This is a rolling 10-year average of uh, the S&P 500 going back to 1935. And you can see it's extremely cyclical. So there's a poor period um, through 1947. Then things take off in the 50s and 60s and 70s. But starting in 71, 72, we we're back down to near zero 10-year average um, in 75, 76. Then it takes off again. And then, of course, we get 2008 when we had the, the bust, financial uh, bust, and back down around zero. And now it's creeping back up again. The 10-year return is roughly 7%. Um, so it's, obviously it's moving back up. Uh, it is very cyclical. The 92-year return for the S&P 500 is 9.31%. If you look at just the last nine years, if we throw out 2008 and look at the last nine years, S&P 500 has earned 1286. So it's been on a great run uh, the last nine years. Following chart just goes through the same kind of thing in terms of 10-year rolling returns going all the way back to 1880. And you can see the various cycles. Looks like a lot like the previous page. So focusing on uh, Plymouth County for a second, on uh, following page, the geometric uh, mean return for the last 33 years is 9.16%. If 2018 is just a normal year, 7.5%, then the 10-year mean as of 12 31, 18 would be about 10.51%. I put this in because back in 2009, 2010, Jim Lomenzo was making the arguments that we ought to be using, you know, 6, 6.5%, 7% as the investor return because that's what the 5-year average was or the 10-year average. And I said, Jim, that's fine if you want to use a 10-year average now, but what happens when a 10-year average is 12 and 13 percent? Are you going to make the same argument? Oh, no, no, no. So it's, for him, it's always a one-way street. He, he always wants to push it down, but he's never based on 10-year average, but then he'll ignore 10-year averages. So a lot of people like to cherry pick from their averages and what they want to look at, what they want to focus on. Um, I don't. I look for 80, 90 years. I don't cherry pick a 10-year period, a 20-year period. Because, again, it goes back to those previous charts, it's very cyclical. cyclical. Um, the state's return, state uh, print fund, has a 33-year 33 uh, 33 mean return of 964. A 10-year return to 17 was 563, but the 10-year return to 2004 is 1111. So it gets back to, you can't cherry pick, otherwise you're going from 563 to 1111. It doesn't make any sense. Their return uh, for... 2018, if it's 7.5%, they'd end up with a 10-year return average of 10.19. So they'd actually uh, be lower than the Plymouth County, which would finish at 10.51 if, that's, if that works out. 
The other thing I work on in terms of that asset allocation is the following chart. It shows a mix of um, equity um, and fixed income. And Plymouth County right now is about 75-25. And based on the long-term returns on 9, 931 for equity and 5.5 for fixed income, that works out to 836. And that's on that basis. Following that is a, is a chart on just Pembroke. I thought, let me take a look at just Pembroke and see what your numbers look like and what's, what's been happening here. So I had, I had all the information for 2009 and 2017, so the, over that eight-year period, um, the number of actives actually dropped from 275 to 251, whereas retirees went up from 109 to 137. Your payroll went up from 10.6 million up to almost 12 million, and that's a 1.6% increase per year. The system average is 1.5. And I bring in the system average because this is a pool. Um, you're, you're in here with the other, what, 55, 51, 51 uh, member units. Um, so it's all pooled together. So how you vary from the pool makes a difference. So your uh, pay increases, the payroll increase is actually slightly greater than the entire pool over that eight year period. Average pay, uh, though, went up about the same at 2.7%. Your crude liability for actives, this is the value of all the benefits that have been earned to date for your active um, uh, employees, went from 24.3 million up to 30, almost 31 million, an increase of 3.1% per year versus the system average of 2.4. So the value of accrued benefits within your system has been um, going up faster than it has for the rest of the system. That's important. Your liabilities for retirees went up faster as well, 21 million to 35.6, 6.8% per year. So versus this whole system at 5.8. Your retirees are doing very well health-wise. Basically, you've outperformed the rest of the system in terms of mortality. They're living longer than the rest of the system. The total accrued liability um, increased more rapidly than the entire system, 4.9% versus 4.2. Um, the assets, because we allocate the assets based on the accrued liability, um, your asset value went up more as well. One goes with the other. The accrued liability goes up more, your assets go more. Your portion of the assets went up more. So you went from 22.7 million up to 41 million. Unfunded liability went from 22.7 up to 25.5. Uh, again, went up more than the, than the entire system because your liability went up more. And your appropriation went up more because um, you have larger liability than the rest of the system. You went from 2.35 million up to 3.4 million, a 4.8% increase versus the entire system at 4.4. So what you can draw from this is really on the following page is that your demographic experience was worse if you want to have lower cost or better if you're the retiree receiving payments and you want to keep living. It all depends on your perspective. Um, but basically, you've had more early retirements than the, the rest of the system uh, as a whole, and you've had lower uh, retiree mortality. Uh, because of the larger assets, um, you get that mitigates the impact. So if you were a standalone system, you know, rather than being a part of the county system. If you're a standalone over that last eight year period, your total appropriation would have significantly increased more than it did because your experience is being shared by everybody else within the system. So it means that those member units that had better experience um, are helping to foot your bill. It's another way of thinking about it. But this is only one eight year period. Um, you guys have been in this in this system for you know, over 60 years. Um, so there may be another eight year period that has a totally different result. But this is the data that I have and this is what I can, I can pull together to say, here's how you guys have fared vis-a-vis um, -vis the entire system over the last eight years. And the last thing I, I have, the last slide I have is I, I say, well, if um, the retirement system uh, decrease the assumed investor return to 7%, what would happen? Um, your unfunded liability would increase from 25.5 million up to 32, roughly a 28% increase. And the appropriation would increase from 3.4 million to 4.4 million. 
So you'd have roughly a million dollar increase if we modified the assumed return. But going back to those that investment graph that I had, if you did go to 4.4 million, it's all great great likelihood that future increases would would be much smaller than the 4.8 percent that you've seen in the last um, eight years. You probably have uh, flat or if not decreasing appropriations from year to year if we went from 8% to 7 So again, you pay me now or you pay me later. Right now, you're at 3.4 million versus 4.4. So that's what I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. You want me to answer the questions? <laughs> if there are any questions, we're all available. You can direct them to any one of us. Uh, We certainly value Pembroke's participation. I think you can see that Pembroke has certainly benefited from that participation. Uh, I hope what you've seen is that there's a lot of research that goes into the decisions and assumptions that we make. Uh, they're not made quickly or without a lot of significant thought. Uh, and uh, we certainly have and are on track for some success in the future. Uh, we want to make sure we're available at any point in time. This doesn't have to be our one and only visit. If you would like us to come back, we're happy to do so. We may not ask the entire team to come, uh, but we certainly uh, welcome you at any of our meetings. Uh, however, I think what we've shown is that uh, your involvement with the Plymouth County Retirement System has been beneficial in both directions, both for the town of Pembroke, and we're certainly glad that you're a member. All right. Dan? I'd, I'd just like the town administrator, the town accountant, and the treasurer collector to just make a brief statement about what they heard tonight and how they've been working with the Retirement Association. I'll take that, I guess. Um, I think what we've heard tonight is that Pembroke is on the right track. We are to be funded fully in 2030? 2029. 2029, okay. Um, we have great cooperation with the Treasurer's Office and the County Treasurer's Office. That uh, That's just a given. I think the reason we're here tonight is to let the residents know that we um, are along for the ride with Plymouth County in a way, but um, we have a liability that's been built up or building up over 60 years. Um, it sounds to me like we're about 10 years away from fully funding that liability. Um, and once we get to that point, the hope is and the plan is that we begin to address the other major unfunded liability, um, which is retiree health insurance. And great liabilities that have built up over the years, um, it, it is an argument that uh, past generations have enjoyed the benefit of lower taxations, higher delivery of service, and um, this generation right now is slowly but surely um, bringing us up to speed, taking care of that, and solidifying our basis. I think that's a conversation that we've had, uh, the staff has had for some time now, and I think uh, Mike summarized it uh, uh, correctly. I have a question. I'll address it to Tom, if I may. Uh, you just said that we will be fully funded 2029, and that assumes a 9% return? 8%. 8%. Okay. I had written down 9. Okay. Um, now, I guess nobody really knows for sure, but you've given us a lot of facts tonight about the expertise you have on your team, and I have no reason to disbelieve anything I've heard tonight. I've heard some very good things tonight, considering this real major issue facing the town for many millions of dollars. 8% um, eight, eight off the top of my head seems high, but you've given us facts and figures here, so I think I need to digest this a little bit more. But if that's what you're saying, that's 
that's what it is. That's great. Well, thank you. And, and we appreciate and we hope that's what you took from this. It's not something that I'm thinking. It's we have a team of experts uh, that thinks about this every <laughs> minute of every day. Uh, we analyze historic trends that date back 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Uh, in fact, our return this past year was 16.33%. When I tell people that, they ask if I can handle their individual investments, which of course I can't do. Uh, but does that mean what we're going to return next year will be the same? No, of course not. What we are in it is for the long haul. We understand we're partners. We want to be here with you to, to provide some smoothing. Another thing that Dan Sherman brought to the table a number of years ago is asset smoothing, so that as we hit those bumpy roads in the marketplace, which will happen, uh, that it doesn't have as dramatic an impact on your budget because we recognize the value of that partnership. I think by having a full funding schedule that has been brought back to the 2029 gives us some flexibility if there's a, a bumpy market, uh, but we feel very confident in the direction we're heading and appreciate your comments and support. Well, if I could just add one other thing. Uh, I think it was very important to have you and your team in here tonight to talk to this board and to the public. It's a very critical issue for us, trying to fund this, finding the money every year to fund this. Um, some weeks ago, I don't remember exactly, we were given some other information that didn't quite jive with your return percentages. And so that caused a lot of concern and uh, was one of the reasons why we wanted you in here tonight. <coughs> And that's why we're very grateful for the opportunity. I know the board couldn't wait to have a chance to come in. I know David Sullivan was particularly looking forward to uh, the chance to talk about it and why we appreciate the board inviting us in because oftentimes there's a lot of information out there, particularly as it impacts finances in the community. We want to get accurate, up-to-date information out there. So, uh, again, if you want us to come in at any point in time, we don't want to be strangers. We know you're busy, so we don't want to impose either. Uh, so that's why I begin by thanking the board and, Michael and Kathleen for staying on top of this, keeping us informed, and making sure we were here to make the presentation. We're sorry we couldn't do it on March 5th, but we're glad we could do it on April 2nd. Can I Thank ask you. while you're up there, uh, Tom, uh, for the board and the public's benefit, uh, uh, what are the, what's the great difference of a, a municipal pension system compared to a private pension system? Uh, I talked to folks, and I have an experience with it myself, uh, a private union for instance, if your pension fund uh, is going down and you need to fund it higher, money comes immediately out of your paycheck to raise it so that so you do not have an unfunded liability in a private pension fund. Uh, as, as we all know, we have an unfunded liability in this municipal pension fund. Uh, what are the differences between that type of fund and a private fund where you can raise the contributions from the participants? There are so many differences. I'm going to hit on a few, and if my team needs to correct me, I'm sure that they will. First of all, in the private sector, oftentimes what you have are defined contribution plans, which are different from what we have in the public sector, which are called defined benefit plans, and I'll highlight that a little bit. A defined contribution plan is a plan where you set up a certain amount of contributions over the life of your involvement in that plan, and at the end of that period of time, whatever you have contributed is what you get out of the system. In a defined contribution plan, if they sense that there's an unfunded liability, they can go directly to the user, whether that's the employer or the employee, and increase the contribution at that point in time to get to where they want to go. I think that's what you're talking about. A defined benefit plan takes a little bit of a different approach, and it's important that everybody understands here in Massachusetts uh, why what we have is actually pretty good. Uh, a defined benefit plan says if you contribute a certain amount, and I'll talk about that in a second, X, over the life of your tenure in employment, when you retire, you will get Y for the rest of your life. That's a good benefit. That is a defined benefit for the rest of your life. In fact, we've seen some attacks on a defined benefit plan, largely from those people that don't have one. They tend to get a little bit jealous of a defined benefit plan and say, boy, my pension system isn't as wealthy or as rich or as defined as yours. It's important to note here in Massachusetts, however, every employee hired after April 1st, 1996, is contributing 11% of their salary, 9 plus 2, to their own retirement. Actuarily, every employee in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that is contributing that is paying more than they need to pay to cover their pension for the rest of their lives. So we have close, <laughs> close, <laughs> not completely. Police and fire is short. Police and fire are short, that's correct, because they're group four. 
and so they they can retire a little bit early. I actually have, I was gonna I was gonna chime in with a number. Okay, so, Dan, so, please. That's why we have actuaries. So one of the things uh, in this book, you guys may have seen this book that comes out. There's a page that says Pembroke on it, and uh, Tom will get it to you if you don't. But on here is something called the normal cost, which is the annual cost per year. The employees of Pembroke are contributing a million sixty-one thousand dollars each year to the system. The employer, you guys, hundred twenty-nine thousand plus expenses of eighty-seven. So roughly two hundred thousand dollars is what you guys are putting into the plan versus over a, almost a million one for the employees. So when you reach full funded status, your four million dollar contribution, whatever it is back at that point in time would drop down to about $200,000. And your payroll is about $12 million. So if you had a defined contribution plan, typically the employer will put in 3 or 4 or 5%. You guys are putting, going to put in less than a half a percent once you reach full funding. So it's much cheaper because of the investment performance. 8% individuals maybe be doing 6, 6.5. That's the real efficiency that this thing works on. That's why this is so much better plan. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think, I think it was important for the public to, to, to be aware of, of the differences, uh, uh, especially for the Board of Selectmen who negotiate union contracts. People want to know, why don't you include uh, a, a higher contribution to the, to the pension fund? Well, it's not within a purview during a contract negotiation. It's part of the Retirement Association to handle that. And it's governed by statute. So you have to follow the law. Anything else I missed, Dan? Uh, you got it. The rest of it was good? Spot on? <laughs> Excellent. They'll train me yet. Anything else? I really am glad that you got to hear from the team. Uh, we're very proud of the team. Again, we have uh, professional attorneys. We have professional auditors. Uh, this, is, this is a group that takes a lot of pride in what we do and what we deliver to our members. Mm -hmm. I have a few questions from the Board of Selectmen. I see a few questions in the audience. Uh, Tim, go ahead. So I, I guess my question would be for uh, Mr. Sherman. Um, you have to forgive my, my actuarial ignorance. I can kind of just uh, process what I heard and try to ask a, a logical question. So I, I, under, I totally understand that when we're talking about uh, long-term uh, rates of return, uh, we should have a long-term view, 20-plus um, year time frame. Um, when I look at an actuarial report and we think about what our funding ratio or our um, our date funded target of 2029 is, that's obviously a much shorter term thing. So that's 11 years away. Um, and what I think I heard um, Mr. Diamond say was that um, expected returns in the, in the shorter term, the 7 to 10 term, are much lower than they would be over a long term. I think the state has acknowledged that and kind of setting a, um, a lower expected return in that, in, in that time frame. So when we think about what we can expect to be a fully funded um, date, um, given that expected returns are much lower over the next 10 years when we can expect to be fully funded, is it really fair to represent um, a 2029 target date based on what we think um, that lower expected return is? So the, the two are really unrelated. Um, the, the 2029 date is, is saying how much more money we're going to put in for the next 11 years so that our assets are equal to our liabilities. So there's going to be additional monies going in over that time period, and it's really not related to the investment return because when you reach that point, you're going to have, right now you guys are over a billion dollars, it's probably by that point it'd be over $2 billion um, invested. So you're still looking at that point and says, okay, what's the investment return at that point in time at 2029? So it's really not related to the funding schedule in terms of being done by 2029. Because you're not done. You're going to have to keep putting some money in. The employees are putting money in. And the assets are going to continue to grow. The liability is going to continue to grow. So they're really unrelated in that sense. So the, the return on investments is unrelated to the chart in the actuarial table that gets us to the 2029 big decline in what Pembroke would owe? Right. I may do it another way. So. Um, what I do is, I, using the 8% return, I say, what's the accrued liability today? And what are the assets today? There's a difference. And I say, okay, over the next 11 years, how much it has to be contributed? Think of this as being like a, funding a, a mortgage. You own a home. 
It's much like that. So you own a home and you have current costs, which we call normal costs like heat, light, insurance, real estate taxes, but you have a mortgage. As soon as that mortgage is paid off, you can burn the mortgage and your payments go down, but you still own the house. You're still in the house. So you still have assets, you still have a liability, but this unfunded piece has now gone away. So that's a small piece of a much bigger, much bigger picture. Does that help? Uh, I think so. Okay. But so if, if say for example in the next ten years, say fund returns over that time frame were four percent, are you saying we'd still be fully funded by twenty twenty nine? If if for example they earn only four percent, there'd be lots of actuarial losses, and the losses would build up. So the, the board will have a choice, a couple of choices. Main choice is. Do we extend the schedule or do we increase the appropriation? So we've had some good years the last eight or nine years, and you guys have shortened the schedule five, six years now, I think, down to 2029. So they also have the ability to extend it if things go bad. So if things go bad and we only have you know four percent returns, I'm sure that they'll be saying, well, let's make it 2032 or 2033. It's like refinancing your mortgage. You say, these things are tough. I want to go from 15-year mortgage to 30-year mortgage. <coughs> Or the, what they've been doing is shortening it, but they could easily reverse it. You can go out as far as 2040. So there's a ton of room to mitigate a bad period of time. Sure. So, so then I guess my, my original question would still stand then. If we're expecting lower than 8% returns over the next 10 years, why wouldn't we either, A, why wouldn't we be pushing that funding, that, that 2029 target further up? Uh, wait, wait till you get it. We don't know. Yeah, there's one thing I'll add there about, about the investment returns. Um, we expect returns to be lower, but we're not investing the same way. We're investing differently in order to continue to be able to get a so it's not. We think returns will come down, but we'll be investing differently, sort of throwing out the old playbook in order to get it to, to maintain that return profile. So you're uh, so you're investing in a way where you can get an eight percent return profile over the next ten years, right? So well, well we're, that's the goal. Um, it's really we're, we're targeting over a 20-year period, but, but that's the goal. Okay. Okay, I guess I understand. All right, any more questions from anybody? I, I, I still would have another question. So I guess my question here would be for Tom, Mr. O'Brien. Uh, early in your presentation, um, you said that all our audit reports are available. I think earlier this year, or last June, I had questions about um, kind of return expectations, um, or just kind of the sources of returns. And I think you and I are both in agreement that um, PERAC um, is a widely used source of information, but it's, it's hard to really um, to kind of make come, come to amends with whether or not that's accurate or not. Um, so at the time, looking for an accurate source of information for returns for Plymouth County, I asked um, to have audit uh, audit reports back to 1997, and I was not granted those, and I was told by Mr. Sullivan that it would cost me $600 to get those, and I actually filed an appeal with the state, and they they sided with me, saying that was an unreasonable expectation, uh, and then Mr. Sullivan lowered his estimate to $550 um, for me to view those audit reports on site at Plymouth County. So my question is. That, to me, that sounds like those audit reports are not easily available and readily available. So I, I guess I'd ask you the question, are the audit reports really easily available for the public to, to review? Again, I stand by my answer, absolutely. Uh, as you can imagine, reports that far back, I, I wonder how accessible they are in many places, but you're more than welcome to come down and, and view them. Tim, you and the board have had a number of exchanges. We've provided a host of documents and information. Uh, at some point, our executive director said we'll have to charge for additional information after responding for countless hours. I'll have him stand up and testify. You are more than welcome to come down and look at that. The, the data will be available. Some of it is off-site storage, so we have to go collect all of that. But if you want those audit reports, you can certainly come down and, and take a look at them. Okay, but just so I, so I understand, then, what, is, what would be your source, if we're not to trust PERAC as a source of return for the fund, what would you deem an accurate source of information? In terms of... And if, we, if you wanted to look at uh, the actual returns of the fund over, say, the last 20 years? Yeah, I think there are lots of sources of information uh, from news reports. 
uh, to the actuarial reports that we get from Dan Sherman, certainly to the audit reports. Depends on how far you go back. Most folks perhaps don't have your uh, diligence, we'll say, and want to go back that far. A lot of people go back 10 years or the like, but... Well, wouldn't uh, the board have the diligence to go back that far? Sure, and, and we certainly monitor this on a regular basis and, and can go back at any point in time. I know that our returns are greater than 9% over the last 28 years. That's good enough for me. Dan, did you want to add something? Or David, did you want to add something? I was going to add something. I mean, it, Makita's reports uh, would, be, would be a valuable source of information there. But the term audit means, means something different to me as a, as a financial person. Uh, these are not audit reports. These are reports that are based on information that we believe to be accurate and third, party, uh, third parties that we rely on. Uh, so it's not audited, as you would say, but, but we stand behind the work that we do in terms of uh, calculating performance. Any more questions from the audience? Any more questions from the board? All right, hearing none, thank you for coming in. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. Good to see you, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, apologies to the Town Government Study Committee. Thanks for coming in. Uh, we are actually going to take Vincent Crane of True Green out of order right now. And uh, Vincent Crane of True Green is here to request that the board renew his door-to-door -door solicitation permit. He was approved on May 15, 2017, and his permit expired on August 15, 2017. He's requesting canvassing hours of 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturday for a period of 90 days. Mr. Crane. Thank you, Board. Um, I do sell a lot different than a lot of people. I taught a lot of people a lot of things, uh, educated a lot of people. I don't just sell. So if I see somebody out in the yard and they have issues or concerns or something, I actually stay there and I'll work with them and I'll teach them even if uh, they don't want to sell, you know, if they don't want to buy anything. But uh, True Green has a terrific package and I'm really excited about this year because when the corporate tax went from 31 down to 19, we made $20 million profit overnight. We invested $5 million back into our customers. We have a pre-emergent that eliminates crabgrass that costs $5 million for this. And we are implementing this, no cost more than what they normally have, which is their regular cost. But we're doing something that's a lot different than a lot of people out there. We're very competitive with our prices, but any lawns that are over 10,000 square feet, we're giving another 20% right off the top of the app. So if the app comes in at $100 an app, we're doing it for $80 an app, even though 100 is competitive. Why are we doing this? This is a way to give back. The other thing we notice is a lot of people really hurt by the storms. And we did make 20 million. So we're trying to help people by, you know, in any way we can. There's a lot of people out there that don't want to do their lawns, but they simply can't afford it. So I'm down in Marion right now, just like I'll be up in Pembroke. And there's a lot of really, really big lawns and people just can't afford to, you know, do them themselves. They, they can afford to do them. They don't want to do them because they're so large. So now we give 20% off, and now we bring it very competitive to everybody. I mean, nobody can beat us in prices. We bought out Lawn Dog. We bought out Scott's. We bought their whole service plan out last December of 2017. This year we bought out Lawn Dog. I mean, our lawn, yeah, D-A-W-G. But Lawn Doctor is where we're working with because we use... Um, a liquid applications that are environmentally friendly. We're very conscious about what we put down on people's property. So uh, it's safe for like dogs, cats, children. Or th the only negligible risk is, is the first two hours because like rain, it gets right into the roots and it absorbs. But what it allows is to be able to do twice as many applications than you would do with a Scotch program and it costs the same amount of money. 
So it, by doing this, people's lawns, they see a, a tremendous difference and a lot faster with the lawns. And the other thing is, is I've been in Pembroke my whole life. I, start, I came here when I was seven. My mom still lives in 48 Raymond Ave at 83. Um, I moved out when I was 28 years old. I'm not going to go to the areas that I already went to. Um, I don't want to, you know, because just, I just went to them last year. So I don't want to go to those same people. So I did around 36, 27, and 53. Now I'm going to do around my area where I grew up. I'm going to do the lakes. So I'm going to go down like uh, I'm going to do Raymond Ave, Fairview Ave, Town Farm Road, you know, areas around there, and then areas up around Wampatuck Street and all those streets. So I'm going to do a whole complete different area. But uh, I enjoy working in Pembroke. I asked him if I could do Pembroke. Of course, I know Rich Wall. I graduated with him. He's a good friend of mine. And, uh, I mean, I, I, when they said Rich, they said Rick Wall last year. And I came out and I saw him and he come right up and gave me a big hug. And I'm like, oh my God, Rich, what are you doing here? I had no idea he was the chief of police. All I knew is I grew up in Pembroke, so I had a good chance of, you know, seeing if I could do the lawns here. Once I found Rick, though, but Rick is a really good friend of mine. So I'd appreciate it if, you know, you let me do it. I don't hard sell anybody. In this time of year, there's a lot of weeds that are out. People are outside. If they want it, then they'll, they'll just tell you they want it. You really don't have to pressure sell anybody, um, especially with the program we have. People are pretty educated. They know what it costs to do their lawns. And if I can come in under the price that they normally use themselves by doing a four-step and a grub control and doing aerate and seed themselves, if I can come under that, save them money, and then do twice as many applications, it's a no-brainer. So that's why it's working out really well. All right, thank you for that explanation. Uh, You've seen it on the chief of police, so you know we have a policy that certain individuals can request not to be solicited. Yeah, I went by the bylaws last year. I saw, I got the list, so I just followed it to the T. Right. Now, I understand that people, you know, uh, senior citizens, and then you have people on certain streets that don't want to be solicited. So there's so many people down there, out there. You know, they, you're never going to run out of people. There's quite a few people in Pembroke. Yeah, certainly true. All right, any other questions? Well, we don't have any reports of any adverse uh, encounters or anything. No. And what about the hours that he's requesting? Are those the same as reflected in the last permit, or are they increased? No, they're fine, but his Saturday started at 10 last time, and he's asking for nine. Yeah, we actually start. We actually start going. I won't go to a house at nine. We actually start at nine thirty, but we don't actually knock until ten. I don't want to wake people up. That's the only difference. I move granting the permit. Second. All righty. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Right. Any opposed? No. I vote yes as well, so that passes three to one to one abstaining. Thank you for coming in. So what's the process now? Do I go to Rich and get a picture like I did last time and get the badge? I'll, I'll reach out to you tomorrow. Oh. All right, next up we have the Town Government Study Committee, and they are here this evening with a presentation on the article for town meeting consideration for proposing that the town move to a town manager form of government. Everybody, um, thanks for having us. I'm Tim Brennan. Um, I'm part of the Town Government Study Committee. That, uh, we've been doing some work over the past about a year and a half or so, um, digging into the organizational structure of um, town government in Pembroke. Um, and we, last spring at town meeting, we had some success in creating the Department of Municipal Inspections. And this spring, we're looking to carry that momentum forward and further make um, 
changes that we think are uh, kind of logically would align um, roles and responsibilities within within town government and ultimately uh, benefit not only the, the workers in Pembroke, but more, uh, most importantly the residents. So just kind of wanted to share with you an introduction of, of what we're thinking tonight. Right arrow. Right arrow. So currently Pembroke's form of government is pretty decentralized. Um, and the Department of Revenue went so far as to call it uh, not conducive to an efficient and effective modern day operation several years ago. Now, now since that time, in fairness, there have been some positive changes. Um, within the town, there are separately elected boards that have no reporting relationship to the selectmen or the town administrator, and that, um, that kind of leads to limited coordination and accountability. We also have leaves many employees that are currently reporting to part-time boards and officials, um, and sometimes those boards only meet bi-weekly or monthly. So um, that really leaves volunteer board members responsible for the day-to-day -day administrative burden of managing professional staff. Um, and one of the another item that the Department of Revenue pointed out, and logically, um, what we're seeing is that in the future, uh, the town really might have a problem finding a qualified full-time professional to replace the town administrator given the lack of authority and central manager responsibility. So um, you know, I think the town has been incredibly lucky to have somebody like Ed around for as long as we have. Um, but I don't, I don't think uh, um, surprising anybody when I say Ed's not going to be around here forever. So I think we're trying to think logically towards the future into how do we, uh, how do we make some changes that when it's Ed's time to move on, we have a structure in place that would attract a really good candidate to come to Pembroke and help us. So this is uh, the current organizational structure of Pembroke that I want to share with people at home and people here. So uh, what we're seeing here is, um, it's a little bit blurry, so we can, the, the kind of yellow orangish squares are elected positions within town. Any blue box is a uh, professional staff. Uh, gray boxes are appointed boards or appointed bodies. Oh, there we go, it's getting a little bit clearer. Um, and red lines are areas where the appointing body differs from the managing body. So that might be a situation where the board of selectmen or another board in town is appointing somebody and then somebody else is ultimately managing them. Um, which is a little bit weird when we think about how, uh, how a professional organization is typically run. Um, and a lot of this comes from, you know, Pembroke's come a long way in the past, past 40 years and it's, we've kind of just layered along um, uh, layered along how government has been structured without really rethinking how it should be structured as we've grown significantly um, over the past decades. So what, what prompts communities to examine um, their local government structure? One reason, um, and I think you'll find all of these relevant to Pembroke, is an increase in population and the result of increase of service demand. So Pembroke's grown a lot. Um, and I think, you know, if, it, if you listen to the, the Board of Selectmen every week, you, you know that one of the challenges we face, or if you visit town meetings, is there's a, there's a huge increase in the demands of the population. Um, there's a perception in, in the community that sometimes municipal departments are not communicating and, uh, co and they're not coordinating functions as they should, uh, mainly because there's a misalignment within the, within the government structure. There's a need for greater oversight in financial matters and service delivery. So we need, you know, we need more oversight to get people the services they need. Uh, poor town meeting attendance. Um, you know, town meeting in our government structure is relied on to make really important um, decisions. And you can anybody who's been to a town meeting knows that you know inevitably once once every other town meeting, it's um, the town moderator is telling people to kind of call friends and family to get them in there to make sure we have a quorum. So it's, it makes it challenging to make important decisions. Retirement of key personnel, um, and then, as I just mentioned, the inability to attract candidates that serve either elected or appointed in, in office. These are all some reasons why other communities in Massachusetts have started to take up the cause of, of examining how they're structured. So I wanted to give a timeline of some changes over the past 20 years. So there have been some positive changes that, um, that we've had to adopt as a community to make sure things continue to function. Now, in 1998, um, town administrator bylaw was passed. So before that, there wasn't a town administrator in Pembroke. Pem Pembroke was run by, uh, I believe, uh, a three-person uh, three board of selectmen at the time? Three-person board. Three-person board was running the entire town. So in 1998, the community took a step um, towards getting a professional manager or professional administrator in town to, to oversight, uh, oversee some of the professional staff. So in 2003, there was an acknowledgment in the community that the treasurer collector position um, 
was extremely important, and it was a, it was moved to uh, an appointed position rather than elected. Um, in 2010, there was an actual there's a town manager act brought to town meeting floor, um, and the community at the time just wasn't ready to, have to pass it. So uh, that failed on town meeting floor, um, and it hasn't been brought up again since. In 2013, the Department of Revenue came into Pembroke and did a did a survey of the town and gave us a report on where they thought there were some inefficiencies in structure. Uh, in 2014, we passed the town administrator bylaw, which strengthened the town administrator position, and that really further aligned, um, just kind of, it was another step in the evolution of aligning uh, professional staff within town hall. Last spring, as I mentioned, we, we uh, passed a, a bylaw to create the Department of Municipal, Municipal Inspections, and that aligned all mun um, inspectional services within the town into one department, and really made it a lot easier for people in the community who are relying on um, services in town hall, whether they're building something um, or planning a structure, uh, to get the help they need. Um, and this spring is where we're proposing a town manager act. So I, at the bottom of this uh, the slide, what, I sh what I'm showing is, you know, back in 1998, the town budget of Pembroke was $23 million. So in the 20 years since then, our town budget at this current town meeting that we'll be voting on is $63 million. That's a three-fold increase. And the population in, in that time has actually increased about 25% as well. So the town is outgrowing the structure that it has. So we're just trying to get ahead of it and think logically about how we can fix some of the issues. So we think that modern, taking a step in modernizing Pembroke's town government should be a priority. And as I mentioned, so this spring our community, we think, can take another important step. We've taken many steps in, in the past couple of decades. Um, towards strengthening our future. I, I say our future because I do think this is a really important foundation to set. So um, in next month's town meeting, Article 25 will ask us, ask residents to establish a town manager form of government. Right now it's Article 21. Article 21, excuse me, it's moved around a little bit on me. Um, so we think biologically aligning roles and responsibilities, um, the benefits are really threefold. One, we think professional town staff will become more empowered to make decisions within their areas of competence. Uh, two, we think elected boards will be, uh, elected and appointed boards will be freed from the burden of day-to-day -day administration. And that really allows them um, to spend more time focused on important policy decisions. One of our big goals here is to really kind of separate uh, the professional staff that operates within town hall and the policy making and advisory boards. We think they're just two totally separate things. Um, you know, advisory boards are really kind of, uh, they're driving kind of direction and policy, whereas professional staff really need to be kind of managed and aligned in, in their day-to-day -day operations. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, town residents will benefit from more efficient and cost-effective services due to an increased professional oversight and streamlined operations. This is really important, especially in that um, we've now seen in the past several, the past few years, um, there's real budget crunch in Pembroke. So we think, uh, you know, the more efficient we can get town government operating, the better it becomes. Um, for our budget and the community as a whole. So our proposed organizational structure, really what we're doing is we're trying to align all our professional uh, town staff under the town manager. So um, the town administrator position becomes a town manager position, um, and under the town manager would sit all professional staff. Now, this, the, the article is not proposing we eliminate any elected or appointed boards. It's simply aligning professional staff under a professional manager. Um, and what that means is a lot of the appointing relationships, uh, you can kind of see that we had red lines on the last slide, uh, and I'll kind of show these side by side. Um, but those are going away. So we think logically it would make sense that if somebody's going to be managing somebody, they should also be the person responsible for hiring them. So in this case, the Board of Selectmen would be responsible for uh, appointing a town manager, and then a town manager would be responsible for carrying out all duties um, related to the professional staff within the town. That, that comes with the exception of the Board of Selectmen would still be responsible for uh, hiring town council audit, um, the, the school committee um, and the school board is entirely separate from this, um, and the fire department as well is also separate from this due to massive loss. So just a little side by side of what the current structure is today and what we're proposing. Um, I think anybody kind of viewing at home or in the room tonight can kind of see what we're proposing is a much cleaner structure, one that you would expect out of a pro uh, professionally managed staff, um, especially managing a town with now a, a over $60 million budget um, in a town of 20,000 people. So.
that's kind of um, this is a high level overview I wanted to give people tonight. Um, us as, the, as a committee, we're trying to spend the next month communicating to the, the community um, what we're proposing and getting any feedback we can. Um, and we just want to make sure it's a smooth process. I think there was overwhelming support last spring for when we proposed the Department of Municipal Inspections, which had similar goals in mind. So we're hoping that um, this spring, when the time comes time for the time to vote on this, um, it's as smooth. Um, and that's going to rely on us kind of doing things like this, getting out um, and telling people what we're doing and why and why we're thinking it, um, and then just communicating over the next month. So. I would encourage people either at home or in the room, if they have other questions outside of tonight, certainly reach out to us. We try to meet every single Wednesday, um, especially between now and, and town meeting. Um, and then we're proactively reaching out to, to several boards and, and, um, and groups within the community. And uh, I hit on this a little bit, but I think, you know, without kind of organizational changes within Pembroke, um, I think we really risk waning confidence in community investment. So again, this spring we're going to be asking the community to pass a two and a half override um, for the second time in a few years. Um, I think if we don't put on, us as a community, if there's not, a, if there's not the perception that um, our goals and the professional staff within town delivering services is all aligned, uh, people are going to be much, uh, much, much more hesitant to, to be willing to invest more in that community if, um, if we're, not, if we're not taking those steps towards proactively realigning things. Um, so I, I just think this is a really big step, um, and, I, and I'm excited about it, and I really hope people within town are, are, um, are engaged and, and, willing, and willing, willing to accept the change. I think that, that's all I had. So we're, you know, we're happy to um, kind of answer any questions tonight, or like I said, um, I have a question. Sure. How soon do you expect to have this ready for the public so that they can have a chance to look at it more than a couple of days in advance or more than a handout at uh, town meeting? Sure. Well, I, I think this summary I'm happy to, pu to publish so people can just see this, but I think the, the article itself is under review currently with town council, so I think we're just waiting to get that back. Um, Ed, you might be able to speak to the timing of that. Yeah, we, uh, we spoke, uh, Sabrina and I did with... Uh, Town Council today and uh, we went over a couple of things and I think what needs to be clarified is is this going to be a bylaw is this going to be a bylaw and a ballot question is it going to be a bylaw and a special act or will the article just allow the town to submit a special act to the legislature so you know that needs to get clarified sooner than later so that everybody knows that Article 21 is an article that will uh, ask the town meeting to submit a special act to the legislature. Or is it going to be a bylaw? Or is it going to be a ballot question? Because you have several of those items that are in the current article. So that needs to be addressed, you know, like I said, sooner than later so that there is no question as to what town meeting is doing that particular night for Article 21. Right, and as a as a, a, a comparable, Hanover had a town meeting vote, a ballot vote, and special act. Yeah, and you don't need all three. You can do just a bylaw. You can have the town meeting vote to submit this to the legislature as a special act. You don't have to have a ballot question. It's not required. It's not a charter. So you have some options. And I think you know, the, the government study committee needs to look at that, you know, like I said, soon, so that everybody knows what the action of the town meeting is really going to do. When will Koppelman and Page, do you think, have that answer for us? Well, I mean, what... Joe Bard said today is exactly what I'm just telling you. Now, if you want that in writing, we'll have that it tomorrow. Just, it just becomes which option, what lane do you want to pick to drive right. it through. Mm -hmm. The only deadline that's concerning is when does the ballot question need to be the clerk. The board doesn't sign the warrant until April 23rd. There's no room to refine it. But the ballot question has to go to the clerk next Tuesday. 
if we need a ballot question. If you need right. a ballot question. And you don't so need that's one. That's the first question. But you we don't need one. Do you you don't need one. No. Right. Yeah. I mean, if it's, we can discuss I mean, it and probably have a resolution on that within a couple of days, I imagine. Sure. Sure. That's, yeah, uh, we'll have them spell it out, but we had that conversation. The three active this members afternoon. of the committee are here tonight, so uh, our next meeting, I, I think we can deliberate on that quickly. Then there'll be drafts back for you for your final review, and you have until the 23rd to get it. Yeah, and we can circulate that as well. I know it's tough because a lot of people don't see the warrant really until town meeting floor, but I'm happy to kind of publish that, get it out there so everybody can see it. I think people should read it. Um, like Dan said, there, you know, there are three people on our committee. It's hard to get people kind of excited in this type of work, but I do think it's a big positive change for Pembroke. So, um, you know, I think the, the quicker we can kind of get it out to the community and circulate it, um, better. You know, 1991, when the town went to the consolidated DPW commissioners and elected board of DPW commissioners, it was a vote of town meeting and a special act. That was it. Okay, we'll consider that. And if I had something to add, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Sure. So I've been working with, uh, with these folks and some others for the last uh, three years or so uh, on the town government study committee. And so the last two years, we've really gained some, some traction. Uh, had some action last town meeting. Uh, it's po positive results with a, a town meeting article to change municipal uh, staff inside to give more control to the town administrator, to make uh, the town hall staff uh, more uh, managed professionally. And I think this is the next step that, that the town needs. People ask me uh, often, uh, as a selectman, how can you make the, the town run more like a business? And we're a municipality, so it's difficult to do, but having a town manager is as close as you can get to running the town like a business. So that's uh, that's what we have thought of as a committee, and you can see by Tim's presentation tonight uh, that it's been well thought out, and it moves the town forward in, in a positive direction uh, for, for the right reasons, for management reasons, and consolidation of, um, of departments that are, uh, are aligned in a haphazard fashion. So I'm, I'm for this, and I'm, I'm glad Tim has put this presentation together um, in, the, in the way that he has. And I, and I hope you folks as selectmen uh, support us going forward. All right, thank you for that explanation. Uh, any other questions for Tim tonight? I have a question for him. How do you um, answer somebody who says that you're putting too much power in the hands of one person? I mean, I, I think the, the power is ultimately with the community, and that the community elects the Board of Selectmen who is then responsible for appointing a town manager. Um, and then, you know, we we're, we're rely on the Board of Selectmen to um, be diligent in their their appointment with the town manager and hope we get somebody, um, you'd hope we get somebody that knows how to run a professional municipal organization. And I don't think, um, I don't think it's putting too much power into one person's hands. I think it's giving somebody the, the responsibility and the lines of reporting they need to run a tight and efficient municipal organization. If I could add to that. So the Board of Selectmen are elected uh, by the voters. And the town manager will have a three-year contract, track, a three-year rolling contract. So uh, the most a town manager could be there is three years without another vote from the from the board of selectmen. The board of selectmen, uh, it's incumbent upon them to choose the right person. It's incumbent upon them to do uh, a, a yearly audit of the town manager's performance. So it's it's not sole power in one person throughout town. And besides, if anyone, everyone knows the departmental, the department heads here, every one of our department heads uh, is a strong, competent person in their own right. And they, in turn, will work with the town manager and not take um, direct orders from the, the town manager, work with the, the town manager. So uh, there's oversight and there'll be uh, collaborative efforts and not simply power in one person. My, my belief. Mr. Chairman, I have a little bit of knowledge of this. Back in 2010, I was involved 
with trying to get this question approved by the town and we were not ready to do it at that time. Since then, I have followed other towns and what they have done. And we're by no means one of the few towns anywhere that are asking for this. A lot of towns have gone to this and it's all based on the job description and we've seen uh, Tim presentation tonight on how the town would be lined up under a manager and uh, it's our, our town really needs to go toward this form of government and as I said other towns have done it we can look at them and see what they've done and how they've done it and I'm uh, eager to get the job description that the committee is going to come up with because it's in the job description of how we set it up. It isn't you have a manager, you have one set of job descriptions. We tailor it to what we want and again the manager is ultimately responsible to the Board of Selectmen. We have control over that person's performance. And so I see no uh, downside to this at all. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again for uh, letting us come here. Thank you for your presentation. That is the end of tonight's scheduled appointment, so I'll be going ahead and moving on to the board action items. The first of which is to consider a recommendation of the police chief to add pole number two on Bell Road to the town's streetlight inventory. Move the recommendation of the police chief. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well. This passes unanimously. The next action item is a vote to enter into a legal services agreement with Hill Law to appeal Mass Housing's project eligibility determination regarding the proposed 40B project on Water Street. I would move that we enter into a legal service agreement with Hill Law uh, regarding the proposed 40B project on Water Street. Second. There is a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well, so this passes unanimously. The next action item is a, to consider the request of, for appointment to Community Center Task Force of Andrew Wandell and John McCown. McCune. McCune. I would move the appointment of Andrew Wandell and John McEwen to the Community Center Task Force. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote as well. This passes unanimously. Next action item is to consider the recommendation on the special within the annual warrant articles 2, 4, and 5, and I will be reading those right now. Article 2 is the unpaid water bill, unpaid bills of $11,387. This is submitted by the accountant. Article 4 is the Water Department Dump Truck with Water Surplus, submitted by the DPW. And Article 5 is 100K for a new water main from the Water Surplus, submitted by the DPW. Mr. Chairman, move favorable action on Article 2, 4, and 5. Second. There is a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well, so this passes unanimously. Moving on to consider the recommendation of the remaining annual warrant articles 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 25, and 26. And I'll be reading those right now. Article 14 
This article is an authorization for the Recreation Commission to hire a senior clerk and has a zero dollar value as it does not seek funding of the position. Article 15, this article requests an increase of the current funding of the part-time adult reference librarian to full-time and has a request of $28,265 associated with it. Um, Mr. Chairman, as, as these will get long and rather than go back, would you consider uh, having a discussion on each one and a recommendation as we go? Certainly. Or else we'll have to go back and recap each one. It's a good idea. So we'll circle, circle back around Article 14 and start there. Uh, I'd just like to hear the town administrator's recommendation on Article 14. Yeah, that's not... Yeah, this will gives the authorization to then to hire a clerk, but it's not funding it. Move favorable action on Article 14. Second. A motion is second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any none? I vote as well. This passes unanimously. Any on Article 15? I ask the same question of the town administrator, his recommendation. Yeah, right now, because um, originally I was trying to have that included in her budget uh, for the increase, and I, and I think that number might be a little bit lower uh, than the number I got from the library, uh, library director. Um, I would recommend right now that this be town meeting floor. So moved. Second. So there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well, so it's passed unanimously. On to town meeting floor. Article 16, 17, 18, and 19 are all related. These, the funding of these four articles are now incorporated in the contingent budget. Article 3, should the contingent budget be approved at town meeting, articles 18 and 19 will be withdrawn, police cruiser and pavement management. And the motions for Articles 16 and 17 will become authorization to hire with no funding motions. As they are undetermined, the Selectman's recommendation on all four articles is currently town meeting floor. Move town meeting floor for all of those articles. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote as well. Aye as well. Passes unanimously. Article 20. Join with Hanover to repair the dam at Ludham's Ford, and we're going to borrow $100,000 to do this. <coughs> Ed? Uh, favorable action. So moved. Second. second. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. I vote as well. So this passes unanimously. Article 25 is the CPC projects includes nine different projects. The first of which is $27,444 for the Bryanville Meeting House for waterproofing measures. The second project is $85,000 for the school department, irrigation at the high school, and North Pembroke Elementary at Dodge Field. Article 3 is $55,000 for the housing authority for a fire alarm system at Kill Commons Complex. Project 4 is 25000 for the DPW Repair Center Cemetery Headstones. Project 5 is 20000 for the DPW Fences, Gates, and other at Ludham's Ford Park. Project 6 is $3,000 for the Historical Society for Ceiling Restoration. Project 7 is 25000 for the Town Administrator, Parking Areas Improvements, Tubbs Meadow, Lots, Fencing, signage, grading at both locations. Project 8 is 100000 for the Pembroke Historical Commission, Phase 2 for stabilization of Turner House. Project 9 is $35,000 for the town administrator for the grounds and site evaluation at Memorial Green. Question. Uh, Ed, what happened to putting handicap ramps at the beaches? At the what? At the, at the town beaches, those rollout mats? You know, I actually, I um, I submitted a proposal, and so I don't know what happened to it. But I did. I submitted a proposal. And there was a, so that's one that I have a question on, I would like an answer on, please. Mm -hmm. uh, because I want, I want those funded for this beach season. I want, right, I, want I agree. Handicap, I agree. I that's why I, mats out that's there. why I applied. Yeah, well... We're going to have to find other funding because we've promised 
the, the Commission on Disabilities sure. that there will be handicap ramps out to the beaches this year, and I do not want to let them down. Um, and secondly, the Community Center Study Committee uh, had a conversation with the chairman of the CPC, and they were hoping to get some funding for a study uh, for land use behind the Community Center, the now Community Center. I don't see that on here. Have you heard anything regarding that? No. Okay. Uh, the handicap rollout mats at the beaches, that, that's a priority of ours. If we can't find it in this funding, we're going to end up pulling money out of some, out of somewhere because we made promises to to the Commission on Disabilities. And a lot of people are going to have egg on their faces if we, if we can't do that this season. Dan, do you remember what the dollar amount was? About 25 grand, depending on how many beaches we do at one time. Well, we plant, well definitely we're going to do Little Sandy and uh, Town Landing. Uh, but as far as in Article 25 of the nine that are before us, I vote favorable action on all nine. Second. All right, you have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well. This is passes unanimously. Moving on to Article 26 is a citizen's petition article regarding chickens and rabbits. A citizen wants to amend the bylaws to prohibit fees for less than 10 chickens or less than 5 rabbits. Uh, Tommy, Tommy floor. floor. Move. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Um, any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well. This passes unanimously on to town meeting floor. That was all the articles for tonight. Uh, do I see 14 and 15 on my last page here? We are, those are, the, those are just the longer versions of the ones we addressed in the beginning. Got it. So we're going to move on to the minutes of March 19th, 2018. Mr. Chairman, I would move the board accept the minutes of March 19th, 2018 as written. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none. I vote aye as well since passing unanimously. Next action item is to vote on the minutes of March 26th. Mr. Chairman, I would move the board to accept the minutes of March 26th, 2018, as written. Second. Um, motion, uh, there's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well. This passes unanimously. That is the end of the board action items. We're moving on to old business. Does anybody have anything under this tonight? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and move on to the town administrator's report. One quick item, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I talked with the DPW today, and we will be opening the uh, uh, public works property on the corner of Monroe Street and Route 27 uh, for brush and uh, uh, wood uh, that can't be taken at the recycling center. And I believe it'll be open this Saturday, and it'll be from... Uh, 8 o'clock to 2 p.m. 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. A question, uh, does that mean then that uh, the DPW was not able or not planning to pick up from people's homes? They are. We're uh, trying to get some uh, uh, price tag that would, uh, as I mentioned to advisory tonight, um, that they are looking at contracting out as well um, for... Uh, tree companies to uh, assist the DPW in removing some of the dangerous situations that we have. Good. All right, thank you for that update. Going ahead and move on to the Ask the Selectman section. Does anybody have anything under this tonight? Hearing none, I see a few audience members in the audience. Has anything under Ask the Selectman for us tonight? Not Ask the Selectman, more just this general statement. Um, okay. To piggyback on it, it's last statement about brush. Um, a lot of questions about the fire department extending the burning 
season. Uh, we will not. We do not handle that. That is actually regulated by the Massachusetts Department of uh, Environmental Protection. So the last day to burn is May 1st still. Um, so try to get it done earlier than later. Uh, we're going to have a good wet week. So this weekend coming up might be a good weekend to get it done. Um, and other than that. They yeah, have to notify your office, correct? They do. Yes, you need to right. call yeah. in. If you don't have an active permit, just come on in. And yeah, that was my work. question for the people watching at home. What, because they have until May 1st, they still have to contact you they do. Every day to they get your permit. approval. Yep. If you have an active permit, just call uh, the fire house at the, the number on your permit. If you do not have a permit, come on into the fire house and we'll explain the rules and regulations. Good. Out at 9, out at 4. Uh, 10. Okay. All right, thank you for coming thanks, in. Steve. All right. Go ahead and move on to new business. Any new business anybody has tonight? Hearing none, we'll move on to upcoming issues. On April 23rd at 7 p.m., UMass Present will be here with a long range forecast model, including revenues and expenditures of the town. Also on April 23rd, there will be the signing of the town meeting warrants. April 30th will be the advisory committee finance presentation. And on May 8th, we have the annual town meeting. On May 12th, the annual town election. So a lot happening in the next month, month and a half. And lastly, do we have a need for executive session tonight? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe we do. Yes, we do, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, reason number seven, which is to comply with or act under the authority of Mass General Law, Chapter 41, Section 111F, Police Department. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second, and the board will not be returning to open session at the conclusion of the executive session. So we'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.